Uh, good morning to all of you, and uh, welcome to this seventh International Risk Assessment and Horizon Scanning Symposium, or IRAS for short. And I'd like to extend a particular welcome to our overseas friends who have traveled from afar to join us here in Singapore. Now, the theme for this edition of IRAS is perhaps a curious one black swans and black elephants. And let me try to explain why. When I was much younger and then a civil servant, and I'm now long retired, I was involved in a lot of planning and policy making. And it bothered me a lot in those days of innocence, I guess, that the tidy world of linear projections and cost-benefit analysis would be disrupted from time to time by surprises, shocks, unanticipated events, and other unruly trends that refused to follow the prediction of experts. And this was a particular problem in the Ministry of Defence where I spent my formative years as both a plan and policy maker. We were making long-term plans designed to last for years, sometimes for decades, committing the government and the taxpayer to hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of capital expenditure on programs, especially platforms like ships and aircraft, knowing full well that the best projections on which these programs were based would sooner or later be disrupted by advances in technology and by new strategic needs and operational requirements arising from changes in the geostrategic environment. Now, the conventional tools at the disposal of the planner and the policy maker in those days were clearly insufficient to address these challenges of what we now refer to as a VUCA, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous operating environment. And just to keep on the theme of animal metaphors, I recently discovered that the OECD has outdone the US military that coined the acronym VUCA during the Cold War and topped it with TUNA, or turbulent, uncertain, novel, and ambiguous. Now, in searching for better ways to plan and to make policies, we came across the now famous uh, scenario planning method which had been developed and pioneered by Shell. And when used intelligently, scenarios can make people aware of problems, uncertainties, challenges, and opportunities. Indeed, by using scenario planning, Shell was the only oil major to have avoided the impact of the oil shock after the Arab oil embargo imposed in 1973 after the Yom Kippur War. So MINDEF, a Ministry of Defense, was inspired enough by Shell's positive experiences and started using scenario planning. And then soon enough, the Singapore government took a leaf out of the MINDEF playbook and deployed scenario planning at the national level. Today, scenario planning is a key part of the Singapore government's strategic planning process. National scenario planning exercises are run every few years and are even incorporated into the annual budget cycle. Now, the first effort at scenario planning at the national level in 1997 produced two scenarios, Hotel Singapore and a Home Divided, whose impact was profound. Among other things, they helped to widen the focus of the government lens from geopolitical and geoeconomic issues to cover issues of Singapore society like aging and social capital, local and community identity, and new fault lines in society. And the influence of these scenarios echoes to this day. Notwithstanding these enormous benefits, scenario planning also has some serious limitations. It is a linear tool in the sense that it projects possible futures based on what we understand of the world today. It's an extrapolation from the present into the future that cannot uncover the hidden forces and complex interactions. 
that cause surprise and disruption. Indeed, we became aware of these limitations soon after the launch of our first set of national scenarios when we were surprised in the strategic sense by the Asian financial crisis of 1997 and 98, a crisis of great force and global scope and whose impact reverberates to this day. Not long after that, we experienced a succession of other strategic shocks, including 911, the uncovering of the Jamia Islamia terrorist network in December 2001, the SARS crisis that almost knocked out Singapore in 2003, and then the global economic and financial crisis of 2008-2009. Now, it was not that scenario planning was the wrong tool. It had already proven its worth in the first set of national scenarios, but it was clearly not sufficient. And it was during this period that I began to encounter strange and wonderful animals. Today, they populate an imaginary menagerie of metaphors, and I've used these metaphorical creatures to better understand the nature of our VUCA or tuna world and to obtain insights into how we could overcome the uncertainties inherent in our planning and policy making processes. The first of these animals is the famous black swan. Nassim Nicholas Talib described black swans as rare, hard to predict events. In Talib's view, black swans are not just surprising but also have another important characteristic. Their impact is large and game-changing. When I read Talib's book, I, was, I found myself hooked. It was not only because the metaphor of the black swan captured the essence of the kind of strategic shocks that we were experiencing and which we will continue to experience in the future, but it also provided another insight that we should not be surprised at all by black swans. Black swans are a product of the VUCA world that we live in. We cannot avoid them. So instead of feeling despondent that we might be poor planners in failing to anticipate such strategic shocks, the black swan metaphor gave hope that we might actually be able to locate the causes of such black swans, and in so doing, we might not only reduce their frequency, but also mitigate their impact. And it was clear that there were others grappling with the problem of black swans. In 2002, soon after 9-1-1, Donald Rumsfeld, who was then US Secretary of Defense, introduced us in his inimitable way to a close relative of the black swan, the unknown unknown. And he famously said, and I quote, there are known knowns. These are things we know we know. We also know that there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know that there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Now, knowing what black swans and unknown unknowns are does not really explain why they occur and how we can better anticipate them. If scenario planning could not help, then what could we do? It would be easy to be fatalistic and accept the inevitability of surprise in the business of government. Of course, it is not in the nature of good governance to accept that everything is predetermined or that we are powerless to do anything about it. If scenario planning is not very useful in hunting for black swans and unknown unknowns, then what were the other options open to us? Now, to address this, problem, even only partially, in Singapore we have started to adopt other tools as well. While scenario planning remains the base, a wider range of foresight tools for horizon scanning are now deployed, including methods such as backcasting, signposting, causal layer analysis, and emerging strategic issues. And collectively, we refer these tools as Scenario Planning Plus or SP Plus. Horizon scanning tries to identify the big game changes by looking for emerging trends and issues, weak signals, and then diving deep into them to see where the threats and opportunities are. To support this effort, the Singapore government also developed a computer-based 
suite of tools called the Risk Assessment and Horizon Scanning System, or RAS. In fact, the imperative for RAS came from the National Security Front, based on the desire to avoid future shocks, such as the one experienced by the uncovering of the Jamia Islamia network in 2001. RAS, which the video gave you a small peek of, is actually a pioneering big data system that is used to search for weak signals that could evolve into sudden shocks, among other things. And collectively, all these tools, when combined, help planners to discover and uncover some, but certainly not all, of the black swans and unknown unknowns out there. After my introduction to black swans, I started learning about butterflies. And this is not about the study of Lepidoptera, to give the Latin name to the species. Instead, my interest was piqued by the so-called butterfly effect, which describes a phenomenon more formally called deterministic non-periodic flow. It is derived from the title of a lecture by Dr. Edward Lorenz, which postulates that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil can set off a tornado in Texas. It is the concept that small changes in initial conditions can produce large effects in a complex and highly interconnected system. And not surprisingly, it was in weather forecasting that the scientists gained a lot of insights into this phenomenon of the butterfly effect. More generally, events and actions in different parts of a highly interconnected system interact with each other in complex, nonlinear ways to produce effects that are difficult to determine ex ante. This is the defining characteristic of the complex world that we live in today. Everything is connected to everything else. An observation made some 3,000 years ago by the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, and more recently by Leonardo da Vinci and by Lenin. And with the butterfly effect, I became more aware of complexity. While complicated systems have Newtonian characteristics in that they perform predetermined functions that are predictable and repeatable, in which output leads to a predictable outcome, in contrast, a complex system will not necessarily behave in a repeatable and predetermined manner. And this is because a system that is complex contains a large number of autonomous parts, agents, connected to one another and interacting in a great many ways. And to understand the behavior of a complex system, we must understand not only the behavior of each of these agents, which could run into millions, but also how they interact with one another and then how they act together as a whole. But with the current state of science, this is an almost insurmountable challenge. Human systems like cities and countries are undoubtedly complex systems. They are made up of hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are the agents in the parlance of complexity. Each person interacts with others, producing outcomes that often confound and astonish planners and policy makers, and that are inherently unpredictable ex ante, and that are only revealed when they actually occur. And this is the pro property of emergence that I referred to earlier. So when something emergent happens, we are surprised, because there are often no warning signs. Or if there are, they are so weak that they are often ignored. Black swans and other strategic surprises are forms of emergence. Now this phenomenon points to an additional layer to the challenge of complexity, and that is our own human nature. Organizations, including governments, often ignore the complexity of their operating environment. They typically deal with complexity as if it were amenable to simple, simple and deterministic, even linear policy prescriptions. In other words, they behave as if they are operating in a complicated environment. 
And this is because all human beings, including the great and the good, are afflicted with cognitive biases or blind spots. And many disruptions, natural disasters, pandemics, financial crises, political upheavals, do not fall into the category of black swans. Instead, more often than not, they are known unknowns or no knowns. Once upon a time, all disasters, storms, floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions arrived without warning. It was the curse of the gods. But today, modern science helps to forecast such cataclysms with increasing accuracy. And many of such disruptions can now even be assigned probabilities. And this ought to lead governments to take precautionary measures, but very often they don't. Indeed, people often have a hard time properly ascertaining the present value of events that will take place in the future. And this tendency to discount the future, to place less emphasis on future risks and contingencies, and instead to place more weight on present costs and benefits, is a common cognitive bias known as hyperbolic discounting. Governments are particularly susceptible to the cognitive bias of hyperbolic discounting. The institutional position that political leaders occupy discourages them from spending time worrying about a problem that will hopefully disappear or only occur when they leave office. So at the risk of generalization, many governments tend to focus on immediate problems and priorities related to the election cycle. They would rather defer expenditure on something that may or may not happen. And that is why, despite understanding the threat posed to future generations by global warming, many governments have discounted these effects and instead place greater emphasis on the current costs of mitigation and adaptation, leading to suboptimal policies. And that is if one takes the long view. Now, this meandering trek that started with black swans, winding through the butterfly effect with excursions into complexity theory and human cognition, now leads me to another member of my menagerie, the black elephant, the other metaphorical beast paired with the black swan in the theme of this year's IRAS. Now, what is the black elephant? I have described the black elephant as a cross between the black swan and the proverbial elephant in the room. The black elephant is a problem that is actually visible to everyone. No one wants to deal with it, and so they pretend it is not there. And when it, a bit like the emperor's new clothes, but when it blows up as a problem, we all pretend to be surprised and shocked, behaving as if it were a black swan, which it is not. Many examples abound in 2013, uh, Ebola outbreak in Guinea, ballooned within a year into an international health emergency in 2014. Over 10,000 people died, and the economic cost to the affected or afflicted nations in West Africa is estimated in the billions of dollars, but could have been nipped in the bud if appropriate actions had been taken at the start. This is an example of the tendency of the human mind to underestimate or even ignore both sudden crises as well as slow burn issues, often through hesitation and until events reach crisis proportions, no one takes any action. Jared Diamond describes this as the phenomenon of creeping normality. Things get just a little bit worse each year than the year before, but not bad enough for everything, anyone to notice. Otherwise, you could call it the proverbial frog in boiling water. Unfortunately, the black elephant is not an endangered species in the wild jungles of government. At best, we can try to cull them, but they are a resident lot because of our collective cognitive failures. So when you think about it, what does my menagerie tell us about the world that we live in? The butterfly effect tells us that our world is complex, is a complex world which creates the propensity for surprise. The black swan reminds us that we will be surprised from time to time, and sometimes that surprise is strategic and game-changing. 
the black elephant and the poor frog in boiling water tells us that even if we can somehow reduce the complexity of our operating environment and locate the black swans, we can still be shocked and surprised because of our cognitive biases. And we should not neglect that other beast that lies hidden in the shadows, the sacred cow. But I will leave that for another day and perhaps for another IRAS. The toolkit of SP Plus, Scenario Planning Plus, is an attempt to reduce complexity, hopefully identify emerging strategic issues that could evolve into black swans and overcome some of our cognitive biases. What are some of these emerging strategic issues today? The rapid advances in technology, particularly those related to the information age, form an obvious cluster of emerging strategic issues. But of course, there are other big issues. The topic of IRAS 27, 2017 suggests some of the other areas that deserve attention, including geopolitics, societal changes, and terrorism. Such emerging strategic issues have the potential to become big game changes. The question is, which ones should we focus on? Which ones are going to evolve into the really big challenges and become, at the same time, big opportunities? Which ones will just fizzle out? Scenario planning and foresight techniques can help us to develop a deeper understanding of these issues and to separate the existential from the merely inconvenient. Wicked problems, which is a term coined by Horst Rittle and uh, Melvin Weber, are another product of complexity along with black swans. Their causes and influencing factors cannot easily be determined. Furthermore, they have multiple stakeholders who see these problems from different perspectives and who have divergent goals. And this means there are no immediate or obvious solutions because nobody can agree on what the problems are in the first place, never mind what the solution should be. Geopolitics produces wicked problems because of the inherent complexity of nations, governments and politics. Terrorism is a particularly wicked problem. And some of you might be surprised by this assertion because you would think that all of us want to get rid of terrorism, except, of course, the terrorists. But even if everyone agreed on how to distinguish terrorists from legitimate freedom fighters and there was consensus that terrorism should be banished, it is not clear at all to me that policy prescriptions would gain universal acceptance. If that were the case, then terrorism would not be the serious and persistent problem that it is today, and ISIS would not be such a serious threat. We all work in organizations that respect hierarchy, and this is how human systems work. But for a wicked problem in which there are multiple stakeholders, more likely than not, there will be different organizations managing only parts of the larger problem. And this is because efforts to understand our complex world often rely on an assumption that what is complex can be reduced into simpler subsets that are easier to evaluate, and then, when re-aggregated, will produce results that approximate the real world. This approach is called reductionism. It is rooted in the belief that the complex phenomenon can be analyzed in component and simpler parts, and the assumption that after these parts have been analyzed separately, you can then understand and predict the behavior of the whole in terms of the sum of the properties and interactions of the components. But actually, complexity tells us that investigating the properties of its components do not necessarily lead to an understanding of the behavior of the system as a whole. Instead, Investigating the features of things at a holistic level is sometimes more important than the reductionist approach. And this is an approach in which information from all sources is shared and across disciplines and across sectors, and then they are evaluated holistically. In other words, complex situations should be studied as a whole and not just in their parts. This approach helps to connect the dots by thinking broadly, by considering how different events, drivers and agents interact with each other, 
we can see the larger picture and obtain a better fix on the possible outcomes. In responding to wicked problems, such an approach is not just desirable, it is absolutely critical. The ability to look at situations holistically is important because, as many have said, everything is connected to everything else. If we look at each issue from a narrow perspective, we will miss the wood for the trees. So this is why there is value in looking beyond just politics or security and to enlarge the view of the world to see how economics, demographics, societal issues, issues of environment and of technology interact with each other to produce the complexities of the operating environment. The complexity that generates wicked problems, black swans and unknown unknowns. Instead of using a narrow angle lens, Sometimes it is better to use a wide-angle lens, even if it reveals less detail. This is the counter-reductionist approach. And that is why there is an inherent value in conferences like IRAS, which looks not just at the specifics, but also at the whole. And we are gathered here today in the spirit of collaboration and breaking down silos. In addition, there is value in getting more diverse insights into such wicked problems by bringing together people from different parts of the world and from different disciplines, cultures and experience. In his study of cultures, the geography of thought, Richard Nisbet identified a major cognitive difference between Western and Asians, including Southeast Asian cultures. At the risk of oversimplification, after looking at a picture of, say, a horse, Westerners tend to remember the horse. But Asians, and I say this with some caution, including Singaporeans, but Singaporeans have been known to uh, adjust to the kind of uh, group they are in, will also recall the background, whether there were clouds in the sky and whether the grass was green. The question for us is whether taking such a holistic, interdisciplinary, intercultural and geographically diverse approach, such as through platforms like IRAS, can normalize the difference. And whether in doing so, more insights into the complexity of the whole are obtained, and a better and a more common understanding of the big challenges and issues facing the world are derived. I think IRAS is an attempt to take a holistic approach in viewing wicked problems by getting experts, both speakers and participants, from around the world in one place to discuss and share their views on emerging strategic issues. We hope to break down silos of thinking and culture, derive new insights that can help inform the work of planners and policy makers, and maybe slay a few sacred cows in the process. Thank you. <laughs>